In April of 1912, the largest passenger ship the world had ever seen set off on her maiden voyage across the Atlantic. Marketed as unsinkable, this Olympic-class ocean liner sank days later after colliding with an iceberg. On this episode of Never Stop Learning, we will be taking a look at the most infamous ship disaster of all time, the Titanic. White Star Line needed a way to compete in the ever-evolving transatlantic trade. Cunard's Lusitania and Mauritania had speed, but White Star wanted to appeal to a different sort of passenger. Their Olympic class of ships would be the largest and most luxurious vessels the world had ever seen. Titanic would be 50% larger than Lusitania's 30,000 gross tonnage, and at a length of 882 feet, she was almost 100 feet longer. Construction of this massive ship began on March 31st, 1909, in the shipyards of Harland and Wolfe. A double-bottomed hull became the base, followed by 300 frames rising 66 feet in the air. These frames were then wrapped in 2,000 rolled steel plates. Each plate was 30 feet long and 5 feet in height. After 26 months, Titanic's hull was complete. On Wednesday, May 31st, 1910, Thousands crowded the docks of Belfast to watch this leviathan enter the water. The entire process took just over a minute, but the ship wasn't ready yet. It would be another 10 months and millions of man hours before the ship was ready to steam ahead. On April 10th, 1912, Titanic was in Southampton being loaded for her maiden voyage. The ship had been designed with a max capacity of over 2,400 passengers. But due to a coal strike in England, many people had decided to delay their trip to the New World. This left the ship with only 1,317 passengers, as well as a crew of roughly 900. At noon, the massive ship weighed anchor and began moving through the narrow channel towards the open ocean. As she glided through the water, her massive displacement caused the SS New York to be pulled into her wake. There were reports of people hearing what they thought were gunshots as the ropes mooring the New York snapped. The SS New York began to gravitate towards the Titanic. A nearby tug, the Vulcan, dashed into action in an attempt to keep the two ships from colliding. Titanic's engines were put to full astern, and somehow the two ships came within mere feet of each other, but the collision was avoided. On the bridge of Titanic, Captain Edward Smith heaved a sigh of relief. Months earlier, while in command of her sister ship, the Olympic, a similar incident had occurred. The HMS Hawk was sucked into the side of Olympic, puncturing the hull of the brand new ship with 25 years of experience as a captain for White Star. Smith had been the ideal choice as commander of Titanic on her maiden voyage. With his cheerful demeanor, he had become known as the millionaire's captain, as he was a favorite among the first class passengers. Titanic's first stop in Cherbourg, France occurred without incident. More passengers were ferried aboard the ship before Titanic was off to her final European stop in Queenstown, Ireland. Not everyone who boarded Titanic was headed for the New World. Francis Brown only made the trip from Southampton to Queenstown. While aboard Titanic, he captured some of the only photos ever taken of everyday life aboard the ship. Brown disembarked in Ireland and the final passengers were brought aboard. By 1.30 p.m. on April 11th, Titanic weighed anchor for the last time as she began her first and final journey across the Atlantic. 
Life aboard Titanic was divided among three classes. First class passengers enjoyed all of the luxuries that this liner had to offer. This included access to the grand first class staircase, as well as the first class dining saloon and staterooms. They could spend an afternoon at the Veranda Cafe with actual ivy plants growing up the trellis covered walls. Cafe Parisian was also a popular spot for the ship's elite to enjoy a meal served by genuine French waiters. Second class passengers enjoyed accommodations that were equivalent to first class aboard other liners of the day. The second class public room offered a large, beautifully decorated setting furnished with comfortably upholstered furniture. Life in third class paled in comparison to the upper decks, but was vastly superior to what many third class passengers had experienced before. Families could stay together in small but comfortable private rooms. For a brief few days, passengers aboard the ship got to experience Titanic as she was meant to be, surrounded by every comfort. By noon on Sunday, April 14th, while most passengers and crew were eating lunch, Titanic's two wireless operators were hard at work trying to catch up on the backlog of passenger messages. By 1.40 in the afternoon, they were interrupted with an incoming message from the SS Baltic. It stated an ice field in the vicinity with multiple icebergs sighted. This spring had been the worst for icebergs in half a century. So once the message was received, it was immediately delivered to Captain Smith. To avoid the ice each spring, ships tended to travel a more southerly route than they would at other times of year. By 5 p.m. on Sunday evening, Captain Smith had positioned the ship 10 miles further south than the normal shipping routes. As the sun set on the Titanic for the final time, many passengers braved the cold to stand on deck and marvel at the view. Once the sun had disappeared, the only light upon the sea was the stars in the sky as there was no moon this evening. At 11 p.m., 10 miles from Titanic, SS Californian sent out a message warning of icebergs, but wireless operators aboard Titanic were still hard at work sending out passenger messages. They famously cut off the operators of the Californian before they could give them the exact location of the ice ahead. After this, the operator aboard Californian decided to call it a night. He turned off his equipment and headed below deck. By 11.30 p.m., the temperature on deck of Titanic plummeted, causing most passengers to retire for the night. High above the ship in the crow's nest sat lookouts Fleet and Lee. The men stared out into the darkness. Their job was to keep an eye out for icebergs. This task was made increasingly difficult as the ship's only pair of binoculars had been forgotten back in Southampton. Fleet squinted to see an object materialize out of the darkness directly ahead of the ship. Hmm. Lee rang the bell three times to indicate something ahead before picking up the telephone. On the other end, Officer Moody relayed Lee's message to First Officer Murdoch. Iceberg, right ahead. By now, Murdoch could see the berg and rushed to the engine room telegraph. He ordered the ship to turn and signaled full speed astern. In the crow's nest, the lookouts held their breath as the dark mass ahead of them grew larger. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the ship began to turn. For a brief moment, it looked like the Titanic was going to clear the iceberg. But as it glided past the ship, a scraping sound could be heard deep below deck. It was later understood that when the ice made contact with the ship, it didn't slice into the hull, but instead caused the plates to buckle and the rivets to pop off. This is what opened up the ship to the icy water on the starboard side. 
Moments after the collision, Captain Smith rushed onto the bridge and Murdoch informed him of the situation. Smith ordered him to ring the watertight door alarm and Murdoch told him it had already been done. Thomas Andrews, the naval architect of Titanic, arrived not long after and informed the captain just how dire the situation was. Andrews informed him that based on the damage report, it was clear that the iceberg had seriously damaged the ship. Over 200 feet of the hull had been opened up to the ocean. The first five of the 16 watertight compartments were flooding and the ship was doomed. Titanic was considered unsinkable due to these watertight compartments. The ship could stay afloat with up to four of her watertight compartments flooded. The iceberg had opened up the hull along the first five. As these compartments filled up, the water would eventually begin to spill over into the undamaged compartments until the ship was completely submerged. According to Thomas Andrews' calculations, the ship had roughly two hours before the Titanic was gone forever. Before we get into the sinking of the Titanic, if you've enjoyed this episode so far, give us a like and subscribe to see everything else this channel has to offer. For Captain Smith, this was the first real crisis in his 40 years at sea. His ship was sinking and more than 2,200 people aboard were in grave danger. To make matters worse, the outdated British Board of Trade maxed out at 10,000 tons when it came to determining how many lifeboats ships were required to carry. This meant that the 46,000 ton Titanic, which had a capacity of over 3,500 passengers and crew, only required lifeboats for 962 people. More than half the people aboard the ship had no hope of surviving. Immediately after the collision, many aboard the ship were curious about the incident that had just taken place, but Captain Smith felt it crucial to avoid a panic. Inside the ship, it was a hive of activity. Stewards were waking passengers and urging them to come on deck wearing their life belts. In the boiler rooms, firemen were working to release the steam within the boilers. If the icy seawater were to come in contact with the pressurized steam, the explosion could split the ship in two. On deck, the crew had begun preparing the ship's lifeboats, while in the radio room, wireless operators were hard at work getting out a distress signal. They initially started with CQD, which was the common distress signal for the time, but switched to SOS, or Save Our Souls, which is the one that we all know today. 10 miles from Titanic aboard the SS Californian, the crew could see Titanic and use their Morse code lamp to signal her, but Titanic's crew either didn't see it or didn't know how to respond. It was reported that they could intermittently see rockets being launched into the air above the liner. But when this news was given to the ship's captain, Stanley Lord, he advised them to continue attempting to reach them by Morse code light, but nothing more. At 1225, over 50 miles from Titanic, aboard the Cunard vessel, RMS Carpathia, wireless operator Harold Cotton received the grave news. Come at once, we've struck a berg. It's CQD, old man. In stunned shock, Harold jumped up and relayed this message to his captain. Five minutes later, he replied back to Titanic that Carpathia was 58 miles away and coming hard. Back on the Titanic, confused passengers began to appear on deck. They had no idea why they were there. Within the first hour of the collision, the ship had only listed four degrees, and many passengers had failed to notice. Captain Smith told First Officer Murdoch and Second Officer Lightoller to begin filling the lifeboats. There was a miscommunication in this order, as Murdoch understood this as women and children first, then anyone else around. But Lightoller took this to mean women and children only, and that the lifeboats were not meant for the men. 
Initially, after the collision, many passengers felt safer on the larger ship instead of in these tiny lifeboats. So filling of the lifeboats was slow, with some being launched less than half full. This changed at 1.30 when the bow dipped 10 degrees suddenly. As the water quickly began to take over the ship, the passengers were coming to grips with their new reality. The ship was lost. Now the passengers began to pour into the lifeboats, filling many to capacity. Wives clung to their husbands as they were forced into the lifeboats. As the last of the lifeboats were being filled, Captain Smith made his final round on deck, announcing it was now every man for himself. It was said that he then made his way to the bridge to await his end, as the captain must go down with the ship. The water continued to fill the ship, and by 2.15, Titanic was rising out of the water at 45 degrees. This was when she finally buckled under her massive weight and snapped in half. This was also when the lights went out, drowning everyone in darkness. The bow was now totally submerged, but still attached to the stern along the bottom of her hull. This caused the ship's rear to rise up into a towering vertical position before disappearing at 2.20. Titanic continued her downward voyage for over five minutes before she finally hit the ocean floor over 12,000 feet below. Now the water was overrun with over 1,000 people, screaming for help. The water was so cold that many died almost instantly from shock. Anyone determined to survive would be able to swim for up to 10 minutes before their limbs became numb and completely useless. The survivors in the lifeboats could hear hundreds of voices crying out for help but that soon faded into silence. They sat and waited for over an hour before the lights of the Carpathia could be seen on the horizon at 3.30. It would be another 30 minutes before the ship arrived and began plucking up survivors. By 9 a.m., all survivors had been rescued. Fully loaded, Carpathia headed for New York. On April 18th, she arrived in New York City, where over 40,000 people had come out to greet the survivors. Of the roughly 2,208 passengers and crew aboard Titanic when she sank, only 712 people survived. Roughly 1,500 people lost their lives. This devastating tragedy sparked major changes in maritime transportation, including the creation of the International Ice Patrol, which is operated by the U.S. Coast Guard. Their job is to monitor and report the presence of icebergs in the northern Atlantic. Due to the insufficient number of lifeboats for its passengers and crew, regulations were implemented to ensure that ships carry an adequate number of lifeboats for all aboard. Additionally, regular lifeboat drills became mandatory to ensure that passengers and crew know what to do in case of emergency. Titanic's radio communication played a crucial role in the rescue efforts. As a result, there were improvements to radio regulations including the requirement of 24-hour radio watches on passenger ships. This change aimed to ensure that distress signals could be received promptly and that communication with nearby vessels was maintained. There were so many what-ifs when it came to the sinking of the Titanic. What if the Californian had acted? What if they had seen the iceberg earlier let us know in the comments below any other what-ifs that you can think of that might have saved so many lives. Thanks for watching this episode of Never Stop Learning. If you've enjoyed it, give us a like and subscribe. Check out some of our other maritime disaster videos. And if you can think of a ship that you would like us to cover, let us know in the comments below. Until next time.